Hello everyone, I'm Rania Kalik and this is Dispatches. We know that NATO expansion provoked the war in Ukraine, but surrounding Russia isn't NATO's only pursuit. NATO participated in the U.S. war on terror in Afghanistan. NATO destroyed Libya. And today, NATO is trying to expand into Africa. This comes as the U.S. is drawing a line in the sand and demanding that countries in the global south pick a side. You're either with the West in its never-ending wars to maintain global hegemony, or you're with Russia and China. And those who choose wrong or stay neutral are being propagandized, bullied, and threatened with sanctions, no more so than countries in Africa. To help break it all down, I'm joined by Vijay Prashad, executive director of the Tricontinental Institute for Social Research and author of many books, including Washington Bullets, A History of the CIA, Coups and Assassinations. Vijay, welcome. Thanks a lot. Great to be with you. It's always so good to have you on. And I should add, you actually have a book that you just finished publishing with Noam Chomsky. If you want to shout that out real quick, remind me of the title. because so I the, didn't... <laughs> No, the, the book is called The Withdrawal. And it's about the U.S. wars. Actually, it's pertinent to our conversation. It's about U.S. wars and, and withdrawal from Iraq, Afghanistan, and Libya. And I think the Libya story is the one that perhaps is pertinent for us, um, given that this was a NATO operation on African soil. Right, and we're gonna get to that. But, you know, first, Vijay, you know, I think people have heard so much about NATO. Um, there's been like an endless stream of content about it since the war in Ukraine began, especially, which is great. But just like as a quick reminder to people, and then for those who maybe aren't familiar, before we get into the issue of NATO and Africa, can you walk us through a brief history of NATO in general, like who founded it and why was it founded? And then we can go from there. Well, after World War II, the United States was seeking a kind of global force projection um, around particularly the Soviet Union, and then after 1949, the People's Republic of China. So the United States operated to build a set of treaty organizations. Um, in 1949, the first of these treaty organizations was the North Atlantic Treaty Organization, NATO, created essentially to allow the United States to have forward projection in Europe to bring Western European countries in the main into the kind of U.S. orbit. Well, it was not the only treaty organization. There was the Baghdad Pact, the Central Treaty Organization, the Manila Pact, the Southeast Asian Treaty Organization. So it was one of these. Now, it's important to remember that NATO never really operated independently of the United States. In the NATO headquarters was another institution. So the United States, for force projection, builds these treaty organizations. At the same time, the U.S. military is reorganized so that it has these commands, European command, the command of, of, Europe, of U.S. troops in Europe, or you know later Central Command, which will be in the Middle East. Southern Command in South America and the Caribbean and Latin America in general. So in the heart of NATO headquarters, which is headquartered in Brussels in Belgium, is also the headquarters of, well, European Command. In other words, U.S. military operates directly in these theaters, like in Europe, alongside these treaties. So there's no gap between NATO and the US military. In fact, the US military dominates NATO and sets the agenda for NATO, despite the fact that the Secretary General of NATO is always a European. Right. And so obviously, like, and, and by the way, just to let those who are uh, watching and listening know, you did write, this is actually based on a piece you wrote, uh, NATO in Africa for Globetrotter. Um, and I'm going to link to that in the description so people can go check that out. But, you know, in that piece, you talk about a kind of global NATO, right? Like NATO's operations didn't stay isolated to Europe. Um you mentioned in the piece, NATO joined the U.S. military operation in Afghanistan in 2001, which, of course, lasted 20 years. And then in 2011, NATO bombed Libya and overthrew its government. And you call the NATO military operations in Afghanistan and Libya a prelude to discussions of a global NATO, a project to use the NATO military alliance 
beyond its own charter obligations from the South China Sea to the Caribbean Sea. So can you elaborate on that? Yeah. So, you know, until the Soviet Union uh, remained intact until 1991, NATO didn't really operate outside Western Europe. That was its, its ambit, essentially. It was after the Soviet Union collapse that NATO first actually quite aggressively intervened in Yugoslavia. Now, technically, you can say, well, Yugoslavia is part of the North Atlantic um, you know, treaty zone. Well, not exactly. Um, but anyway, NATO entered into the war in Yugoslavia in 1999. That was the first, to some extent, out-of-area operation. But really, the first out-of-area operation was in Afghanistan in 2001-2002. Um, now, why did NATO intervene in Afghanistan? The United States is part of the treaty, the North Atlantic Treaty. And in that treaty, it says that if one of the member states is attacked, everybody else will come to their defense. So the United States approached NATO headquarters after 9-11, and NATO said, well, you've been attacked, and therefore we will join your a global war on terror. It's important for people to understand that NATO didn't merely operate in Afghanistan after 2001. NATO operated in many different places supporting the United States in the so-called so -called global war on terror. So that was the first major out-of-area operation. The second one was Libya. I mean, there was no reason for NATO really to get involved in Libya. Uh, in 2011, we can talk about the reasons for the involvement, but it was a major out of area involvement because, look, Libya didn't attack any NATO country. It didn't, you know, trigger the NATO uh, charter. NATO simply, as an act of, in a sense, you know, uh, aggression, attacked Libya. Yes, there was a UN Security Council resolution 1973. Yes, that Security Council resolution authorized force. Asked, said that members could use force and so on. But they were allowed to use force to maintain a no-fly zone, not to attack the Libyan state and to attack the Libyan military and so on. So NATO actually conducted a war of aggression, an illegal war of aggression against Libya in 2011. Actually, that, Rania, that war of aggression in 2011 sets in motion a discussion inside NATO headquarters to basically become the global policeman. If you can do it in Libya, why not do it anywhere else in the world? And that is actually quite chilling. Discussions about global NATO accelerate after 2011. And then I want to get back to NATO, but just to step away for it, from it for a moment, uh, can you maybe discuss the European military footprint in Africa in, like, in sort of parallel to the last 20 years that is unrelated to NATO? Well, of course, you know, there's an old colonial history. I mean, the Europeans right. went into the African continent, plundered it for millennia, a hundred years, more. And then, you know, in a very famous conference in Berlin in 1884, divided up the, the, the continent, um, where there was sovereign countries like Ethiopia, the Italians invaded, you know, so they were not going to permit any part of the African continent to be sovereign. It's got to be understood that Europe played a several hundred year colonial, um, military colonial um, intervention into Africa and colonized and dominated the, the continent. You know, this all this doesn't start recently. This is an old history. Well, two European powers continued their military operations long after World War II. One was Britain, which maintained its hold on some of its colonies and then was quite brutal, you know, brutal. Caroline Elkins has a terrific book, professor at Harvard University, terrific book on British brutality against the people of Kenya in the 1950s. So the military presence of Britain on the continent continues. Britain was largely removed from the continent due to the decolonization process, but France remained. France never actually left and then continued to return uh, punctually as they did in Mali in 2013. So the French maintained a kind of military footprint in parts of so-called French or Francophone Africa, uh, their old colonial powers in West Africa and in the Sahel region. So France continued to have a presence. The other country that had a presence, of course, was Portugal, which was booted out by the people of Angola, Mozambique, Cabo Verde in 1974. 
what's interesting is right after World War II, the United States government starts to have a larger and larger first covert CIA type operations and then overt military presence. The decisive entry of the United States is in the Congo. When the U.S. intervened to overthrow the government of Patrice Lumumba in 1961, principally, and this is important because it's not so well known, principally because the uranium used in the bombs in Hiroshima and Nagasaki come from the Congo. And when Patrice Lumumba wins the election in the Congo, the United States was afraid that that uranium would then be handed over to the USSR because Lumumba was a man of the left. So they overthrew the government of Patrice Lumumba to maintain hold of the uh, uranium mines. There's no question about that. That's in the record, in the public record, in fact. So the United States starts to increase its military footprint in the last two decades. That is to say, after 9-11, the U.S. has actually been quite aggressive. In 2002, under um, essentially orders from Washington, NATO started a liaison project on the African continent. That's from 2002 onwards, started having liaison relationships, both with the African Union, where in fact, in the headquarters in Addis Ababa, there's a NATO office and with individual militaries of friendly countries. Secondly, that's in 2002. Secondly, in 2007, the United States creates AFRICOM, the African command, whose headquarters remains in Stuttgart, Germany, because no African country is willing to host the African command. But AFRICOM with NATO working through institutions like the African Union and friendly African governments has had a significant and increasing presence on the African continent, largely unremarked, including 29, at least 29 military bases on the African continent. That's just wild. And then, of course, we can come back to the issue of Libya. Could you talk about the significance of NATO's regime change war in Libya, specifically on the secure on the security situation in Africa and how the sort of chaos that car that has caused has then been used by NATO, by AFRICOM to justify military expansion into Africa? There's a number of points to make on this, Rania. The first point is about Libya itself. So in uh, the early months of 2011, there was certainly unrest in the city of Benghazi, which is in the eastern flank of Libya uh, toward the Egyptian border. Well, as a consequence of that unrest, sections of the Libyan military defected to the protesters and a civil conflict broke out, which had a military aspect, particularly around the towns of Ashtabia and then in the Mediterranean. There were dogfights between um, you know, those Air Force pilots who had defected and those who remained loyal to the government in Tripoli. Um, in the middle of all this, there was a discussion at the United Nations whether there should be an intervention. The UN passed a resolution in 1970, which said that no arms shipment should happen to any side of this conflict. In other words, let's dial the conflict down. At that point, the African Union empaneled a peace mission which was prepared to go to Tripoli, go to Benghazi, talk to all sides of the conflict and create some sort of peace agreement. Well, the French in particular, but also the government, US government of Barack Obama, not interested really in, in this peace mission. In fact, they circumvented, prevented the peace mission from flying into Libya, grounded the plane uh, and began bombing Libya after UN resolution 1973. So the first outcome of this NATO war of aggression was it undermined the African Union as an institution of peacemaking on the continent. The second decisive outcome, and I think this one is important, is it of course destroyed Libya because the French in the United States under the cover of NATO bombed Libyan state institutions into smithereens and therefore endowed whatever uh, government was going to come with destroyed infrastructure. In fact, we are now in 2022, 11 years later. Libya does not have a stable government even now, 11 years later. One reason for that is the nature of the actual bombing of the Libyan state. The third outcome of the war, which is really quite important, is the United States essentially flew in right-wing jihadis from Turkey, from the Syrian border, brought them in to be frontline troops, 
uh, against the forces of Mr. Gaddafi. Now, this is interesting. Some of these people were members of the Libyan Islamic Fighting Group, a much earlier um, manifestation or kind of pro-Al-Qaeda group inside Libya. But they brought other people, quite hardcore fighters, you know, by aircraft. They shipped them into Benghazi, sent them to Ashtabia, sent them to go and fight uh, in the front line. Now, these people, uh, once the so-called NATO part of the war ended, when Libya was in chaos, several of these people came from places like Algeria and so on. Well, they started going home. Now they were well armed. They were back on the North Af in the Maghreb region. They go off across the border to Algeria. They go down south uh, to Mali. They enter Niger and so on. And they start destabilizing that whole region. So suddenly you have a new group called Al-Qaeda in the Maghreb. Never heard of them before. Um, suddenly in Mali, the Northern Malian Tuareg Rebellion, which is an interesting rebellion, some of it led by Tuareg aristocrats. In the central region of Mali, where there's a dispute between sedentary um, communities and nomadic communities, all of these old conflicts in Mali, the Tuareg conflict, the conflict in central Mali, get wrapped into some sort of Al-Qaeda-esque franchise. And these forces coalesce and they go into the south, southern part of Mali, they take to uh, Timbuktu, they start going south. And it's at that point in 2013 that the French make a big show of intervening to block the entry of Al-Qaeda um, to take over Mali. You know, And this becomes a door to allow French and US intervention in the whole Sahel region. The French create a group called uh, G5 Sahel, which unites five countries in the Sahel they all allow French footprint. We'll come back to Niger, I'm, I'm sure, later. But, you know, this third aspect of the destabilization of, of, of the Maghreb, but particularly, you know, to some extent, Algeria, but to really the Sahel region, it has gone largely, Rania, largely unremarked in the media. How Mali went into chaos, parts of Niger went into chaos, Mauritania uh, faced a lot of problems. And, and I got to be clear with you, uh, to some extent, the rise of Boko Haram around the lakes region in Nigeria is related to this destabilization. And there is also the issue of the flood of weapons, right? Because that's created like its own economy across certain parts of Africa. The flood of weapons, not just from the war in uh, Libya, but also to some extent the war in Syria. Um, and I assume at some point, I mean, these weapons that are going to Ukraine, I mean, we already know right from this recent CBS report that was then retracted <laughs> after anger uh, is showing that these weapons that are, you know, were just pouring into Ukraine aren't necessarily all even making it to the front lines. So this creates a huge black market of weapons. They end up flowing to conflict zones all over the world. And in particular, Africa, you have the issue of these Salafi jihadist groups cropping up in various places, justifying further sort of like military operations like you're talking about. And then you have the issue of, you know, creating this economy of like mercenaries where there's all these people who are unemployed in these sort of like failing neoliberal economies who then in certain parts of the, these various regions end up like, okay, one easy way to make money is just become, I don't know, become a soldier somewhere for some cause or issue or, I don't know, mining company. Um, just pick up a weapon and go be a soldier. Um, I don't know if you have anything to add about that, but I just think that's an interesting aspect that hasn't really been thoroughly investigated like it should be as sort of a consequence of all of our wars. Well, you know, when I was reporting in the Sahel region, I was quite struck by how so many of these Al-Qaeda type groups, including Al-Qaeda in the Maghreb, how many of them are actually just petty brigands? I mean, these are people who are involved in the cigarette trade across the Sahara. People might be surprised to learn that one of the big new conduits for cocaine to enter the United States is it comes from South America to West Africa through the Sahara goes up across the Mediterranean and from Rotterdam comes to New Bedford in Massachusetts. I mean, this trajectory is remarkable. There are, there's a, there are towns in, um, in the Sahel with names like Cocaineville and so on, where these kind of cocaine dons have big houses. You know, they're all related in some ways to the mafia of Al-Qaeda in that region. Then there's, of course, weapon smuggling. You know, the way I understand it is weapons come south of the Sahara and human beings go north. And it's the same people that conduct this traffic. They drive those same 
ISIS type white Toyota trucks across the Sahara going yeah. from say Agadez in Niger out to you know uh, Sabra in 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 trip in in Libya and then north to the Libyan coastline they bring weapons down and carry humans up it's the grotesqueness of that trade um you know that's something people should face like look i know that these groups call themselves al qaeda and and then you get now islamic jihad and so on but most of the people who seem to sign up for these groups are petty thugs and they are involved in all kinds of illegal trades especially in this region where borders are pretty porous and you can actually make money smuggling cigarettes to get out of excise taxes <laughs> and so on you know a lot of money is made in the in the cigarette trade so i mean yes of course weapons and you know when the ukraine conflict began i i said that you know you're going to give weapons there they're going to disappear into the black market it's nothing it's no rocket science i wasn't being prophetic or anything in all these conflicts in in afghanistan in 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 iraq i mean in iraq the amount of us weapons that went in there and then disappeared you know into the so called black market it's not really a black market you know you can walk into well known places in beirut and buy all kinds you can go into these people's <laughs> homes and you can ask them for a rocket launcher and they show it to you you know they open a closet and there in the closet <laughs> is a rpg they say how many of these do you want i mean it's not a really a samis that market it's pretty open thing and so yeah. you know they are all american weapons because the us is flooding the world with weapons i think chris hedges put it very well terrorism isn't destroying the middle east it's the weapons industry 100% and then of course you have all of this um you know th these groups also i just want to mention that like isis is sort of the new kid in town, like the new popular kid in town across Africa. Like there's a lot of groups who prefer to like claim that they're ISIS. And then sometimes we'll, ISIS will claim that groups are ISIS when they're not really. And their groups will just say, yeah, we are. So it basically like makes this, you know, terrorist infrastructure seem bigger than it actually might be. Cause you mentioned most of these people are petty thugs, but then it's just this cycle because in the end, all of this is then again used to justify further like military expansion after all of these countries, you know, in all these countries. It's it's actually a brilliant model, um, like overall for like expanding AFRICOM, for expanding NATO and for the Europeans to expand, you know, whatever operations they're, you know, uh, launching across across these various regions. But I want to connect this a little bit more to the issue of what we're seeing play out right now in terms of information warfare because it seems like even though even though this this military expansion is taking place the US and the western countries are in many ways at the moment losing in Africa in the long term you know Mali something you've written about Mali just kicked out uh French troops for example and then of course half the African countries abstained or voted against the UN resolution condemning Russia and then most of Africa is really just refusing to get on board with the Western sanctions on Russia, largely because they're reliant on these raw commodities. And then this is, has upset the Americans so much that as we're recording this, you know, um, this week, Secretary of State Anthony Blinken is on this Africa tour or just after Russia's Lavrov to try to convince African countries to stop buying Russian commodities like grain and wheat and fertilizer, like even if it starves them. Um and so I'm just curious, like, if you would agree with that assessment, that as far as the, you know, sort of sphere of influence goes, the U.S. seems to be in a very weak position at the moment, despite this military expansion over the war in Ukraine. It's complicated, you know. I mean, I, I know it's horrible to hear that phrase. It's complicated, but it is pretty complicated. So there is, I think, a new mood appearing on the African continent among the 55 heads of government. Not all of them, obviously, not the king of Morocco and so on. Uh, but in many places, there's a new mood appearing. Let's take the case of Niger. You know, it has become clear to the people of Niger that the reason the French and the United States have military bases in Niger is not really to fight Al-Qaeda. It's not really about security issues and so on. But it's for two other issues. Number one. They are there because they are policing the Sahara border. You know, Europe wants its border to be south of the Sahara, not north of the Mediterranean. And that's the reason why they have heavily uh, policed um, countries like Niger, which are a pathway into Libya. Secondly, in the town of Arlit, which is in the northern part of, of Niger, um, it's the home of yellow cake uranium. 
something like 75% of the households in France have their light bulbs powered by uh, the uranium from Niger. It's very clear that the reason our elite is garrisoned by the French troops isn't for human rights, but it's for uranium. So there's a growing sense in much of the continent. We saw that in, in Mali, the protests against the French military occupation. And then the French had to actually leave Mali uh, because the, the second military coup chucked them out. There's a growing mood among people uh, that the military occupation in this part of the world is largely based on the principle of raw materials. But the other side of it, uh, which I think is, is quite important, quite key, not just about raw materials, is that there's a feeling that countries just don't want to be bullied around anymore. And I think that's the reason when the African Union was under pressure by the United States to hold a talk by Vladimir Zelensky of Ukraine, um, only two actual heads of state came to that Zoom meeting. And in fact, around the time, just before Zelensky came to meet the African Union, in other words, only two countries um, came for that meeting. Just before that, the leaders of the African Union went to Sochi to meet Vladimir Putin. So there's a kind of complicated situation. But at the same time, Rania, I wouldn't want to exaggerate this too much because the United States still has a very large military footprint. As I said, 29 military bases. United States yet uh, using the International Monetary Fund has a great uh, position in terms of development financing on the continent. These things are also there. Um, so countries are trying to navigate the situation, but there is definitely a new mood growing on the continent. And of course, you know, there's also this, like you mentioned, bullying taking place. I just want to note there is this bill that was introduced in Congress by the, the representative uh, Gregory Meeks from New York. It's called H.R. 7311, and it's called the Countering Malign Russian Activities in Africa Act. And this bill calls for the State Department to monitor the relationships between Russia and African countries and officials and to punish those African countries and African officials who are supposedly aiding Russia's malign influence and activities, whatever that means. It's, and it's actually not only limited to African countries. The bill also demands that the State Department also report on how Russia is, and I quote, manipulating African governments and their policies, as well as the public opinions and voting preferences of African populations and diaspora groups, including those in the U.S., um, so I think that's pretty astounding, that language. But, you know, most importantly, it, this bill calls for punishing African governments and officials for violating any unilateral U.S. sanctions on Russia and Russian companies and individuals. So there's that that's sort of like in the works in Congress. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, you know, U.S. ambassador to the U.N., Linda Thomas-Greenfield, has also told African countries um, what they can and cannot buy for their livelihoods, you know, on her visits to Uganda, Ghana, and Cape Verde. She said that Russia has been peddling a false narrative, that Western sanctions are to blame for keeping much needed grain from international markets. And then she actually warned these countries that there would be consequences for buying Russian oil. So on the one hand, you have the Americans like warning about Russian and Chinese malign influence. On the other hand, you have this kind of US malign influence that's just making these threats. So I'm curious what you think about, about this uh, dynamic. Well, you know, look, the United States government is entitled to say and do whatever it wants. It's a sovereign entity. And if they want to say to countries, you can't do this, you can't do that, the countries better make their own decisions. I mean, you know, I'd like to see the government of Uganda say, look, you know, you can't tell us who we can be friends with. After all, um, Russia continues to be a member of some standing in the United Nations. Um, it has, you know, a foreign minister and ambassadors, and these countries have to deal with Russia. Russia is a major power in the world. It's ridiculous for them to be bullied. On the other hand, I want to encourage your viewers, Rania, to go to the Monthly Review website, where there's a new investigation out by Ajit Singh and Roscoe Palm, which actually details how the United States government, through the National Endowment for Democracy, in association with private US foundations like the Open Society Foundations and Luminate, which is Pierre Omidyar's foundation, this conglomerate of public-private intervention has intervened to influence the South African media, including major uh, liberal publications such as the Daily Maverick and so on. So, you know, the United States 
famously goes around saying China or Russia are, you know, unfairly intervening, forcing people to do this and that. Meanwhile, the evidence suggests the United States government, as you said, the UN ambassador going to a country saying you can't buy this from here or that from there. Or Mr. Anthony Blinken going to countries, you can't talk to this, you can't talk to that. And now we hear that liberal publications taking money from U.S. foundations and from the U.S. government through this complex of public-private partnership are being told basically what to go and research. In fact, um, some of the great breakthrough stories that were done on, on quote-unquote state capture in South Africa appear to have been dictated by the Open Society Foundations. At least that's how the Open Society Foundations claim in their own uh, in their own releases. You know, it may not be true after all. They may be also exaggerating the influence, but that's interesting. It's up to these publications to deny it in a way. So the U.S. government can tell anybody how to behave, what to do. That's fine. It's up to the countries in the world, you know, the 192 other countries that exist, whether they want to be bullied around. I mean, look, again, I don't think it's outrageous for a country to tell another country what they should eat or drink. That kind of thing happens all the time. But should you have to listen to them? Not so. For the dignity of countries, people should just say, listen, we, we can trade with whomever we want. Sorry, you can't make that. a. If you make that, if the United States says, if you trade with Russia, we won't trade with you. That is going to end up hurting the United States, I'm afraid. So people in the United States need to think about that. Whether this kind of scorched earth foreign policy going around the world telling countries, if you trade with China, if you trade with the Russians, then you won't trade with us. People might turn around and say, okay, we won't trade with you. That's going to really hurt the United States. And so pe people in the United States need to think about these issues, not be arrogant enough to believe that countries in Africa, because of a colonial hangover, will say, well, obviously, we'll go with the U.S. over the Chinese. May not That may not be the answer you receive. Yeah, it's also funny because, you know, today there was this article out in the New York Times and it was actually complaining that Facebook's like Facebook and Twitter and all these social media companies, they're like censorship mechanisms uh, don't extend into non-English outlets so that, oh, you know, Russia, like basically Russia has all these outlets in Spanish and Arabic that aren't being censored like the English speaking ones. And that's actually bigotry on the part of these you know, a Facebook and Twitter to not be also censoring in Arabic and English. I mean, there really is this obsession with controlling the narrative uh, in these countries. Like, I think that these sort of like American exceptionalists are having a very difficult time understanding, like, why, why don't Africans and people in Latin America and people across the Middle East, like, why, why don't they care about Ukraine the way we do? They just can't understand that, you know, maybe people in these global South countries, like, don't have the bandwidth to care about a war in Europe, given what's taking place in their own countries, or maybe their own experiences with the West make them more, you know, make them more skeptical of Western narratives when it comes to wars. I mean, there's so many reasons other than maybe they're watching Russian media. And maybe it is because they're watching Russian media and getting a different side. But at least in my experience in like Lebanon and Iraq, I feel, I feel it's more like a result of it's a European problem. It's not our problem. And also, like, the West lies. <laughs> that's just, I don't know. I, 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 that's how I see it, at least. It's just stunning to me, the, like, the level of, like, the lack of understanding, the lack of awareness. But anyways, I wanted to ask you about a, a somewhat related issue, and that's the issue of Germany. You know, Germany is gearing up to become the world's third largest military spender, which is a pretty big deal. And all of this is under the guise of Russia's war on Ukraine. However, you know, it seems very unlikely that Germany would ever actually fight Russia. Like, I don't think they have that capability. I don't think they're going to have that capability. I don't think they actually have that intention. So I'm wondering, do you think that this could lead to Germany getting more involved in places like countries across Africa? Rather, you know, just using the sort of Russia issue as a pretext in terms of the military spending, because we already do see the Germans playing a role in Mali. I mean, I know it's not a combat operation, but they are there. And Germany does, ha does have a little known nasty history across Africa that, of course, we don't really grow up learning about in the U.S. or probably anywhere in the global north. Uh, but, you know, what do you think about the prospects of the sort of militarization of Europe that this is uh, provoking and what that might mean in countries across Africa?
Well, I think it's important to actually just name what you were saying, which is that um, before the Holocaust in Europe, German colonialism in places like Southwest Africa uh, was responsible for documented genocides against the indigenous people of, of these areas, um, you know, the Heroro people and others. I mean, these are documented on the record genocides conducted by the German military forces in on the African continent prior to um, the Holocaust. You know, M.S. Cesar's great discourse on colonialism sets the record straight. He says, look, you know, what happened in, in Germany was terrible and in Poland and so on was terrible, the Holocaust. But the people of Africa, of Asia, Latin America, we have experienced this kind of genocidal um, you know, policy for maybe a hundred years during the colonial period. So this is not a surprise to us. We are not surprised that this has happened uh, in the world. Europeans are surprised that it's happened to Europeans, but they are not surprised when it happens to non-Europeans. I mean, that was M. S. Cesar's astoundingly uh, powerful text, Discourse on Colonialism. Okay, uh, there it is. So my feeling is that Germany right now is in a really tough position because, you know, if you look at it, look at the German economy um, over the last several, maybe the last decade, at least under the last period of Angela Merkel's um, chancellorship, Germany became more and more dependent on Russian um, energy exports, more and more dependent so that the day that the uh, conflict began in Ukraine, about little more than 30 percent of Germany's energy needs were supplied by Russia. In fact, uh, recently, in the middle of this conflict, uh, German Chancellor Olaf Schulz has uh, repeatedly said that Germany can't stop buying energy from Russia. And he went back and in inspected uh, one of the Nord Stream 1 uh, turbines. You know, that was an interesting moment when he went and inspected those turbines. It's very unlikely that Germany is going to be able to go to zero uh, from uh, buying 30 percent of its energy from Russia. Now, how will they, um, you know, essentially uh, substitute for Russian energy? What's the options? Look at the options. Number one is buying liquefied natural gas from the United States and the Gulf Arab states. Way more expensive than piped natural gas through Nord Stream 1 and 2. Can the German economy bear the increased cost? No. Number two option, maintaining nuclear. You know, Germany has pledged to sunset its a nuclear power plant. Well, they're going to have to maintain nuclear. Number three, even more dramatic. Germany has said they're going to go to zero coal. Now there's talk of restarting coal, uh, you know, generation. Well, you will have no leg to stand on now when you criticize India, when you criticize other countries in the south that rely on coal. Suddenly, in the middle of Europe, you're going to have coal-fired energy plants again. Well. If you're going to take seriously the break with Russia, you're going to have to go to coal. Well, and then next, are you really going to contemplate a war with Russia, an all-out war? I mean, right now there's a conflict taking place in Ukraine, which is a kind of slow but steady uh, attrition of, uh, of, of basically the defenses of, of Ukraine. I mean, the Russians are slowly, terribly... Um, you know, getting their, making their gains. And nobody's capable of stopping them. I mean, the land bridge to uh, Crimea is basically complete. Don, the Donbass region is basically integrated. Um, what else remains? You know, the, the Russians don't really want to seize Kiev. They certainly want to uh, weaken the government in Ukraine. That's clear that that's their war aim. But nobody is capable of stopping them. You know, this is just a slow and ugly advance of their goals. Why not? stop the war, start a negotiation, see what kind of outcome will happen. I mean, there's no way that the Russians are going to withdraw from Crimea. If they're not withdrawing from Crimea, there's no way they're going to withdraw from the land bridge they have made. There's no way they're going to say, we're going to give you the Donbass region back. So there's going to have to be major negotiations about all this. Well, rather than do that, Biden, the Germans and others continuing to give military assistance to Mr. Zelensky and saying, don't uh, have a peace agreement. What What are you going to do? Are you serious? Germany is going to go to war with Russia. Didn't turn out very well in the 1940s. And, you know, it may be worthwhile for the French to recognize that when Napoleon tried to go and defeat the Russians, he, he was also defeated. You know, um, it's not easy to defeat Russia. Russia is an enormous country. 
uh, it stretches from one end of Europe right to the other end of Asia. I mean, what are we talking about here? You know, what is the defeat of Russia going to mean? And it looks very unlikely, Rania, that any kind of a campaign inside Russia is going to, in a precipitous way, get rid of Vladimir Putin from the leadership or his political party, which has a very strong lock on popular opinion. So, I mean, I don't understand what German spending is going to be used upon. It's certainly not going to be used on, um, you know, a war against Russia. That's suicidal and crazy. I have a feeling um, that this is just happening to please the U.S. You know, that we're going to increase military. It's what Trump had been demanding for years. But, but look at what's happening in Europe. It's complete political chaos. In Italy, they're not going to have a, a good government there. Eastern Europe. You got Orban again talking about the great Christian alliance and so on. I mean, Europe is in extreme disarray. Some of this is a consequence of this war in Ukraine, just as the NATO war in, in, in Libya uh, destabilized most of North Africa. I think this Ukraine conflict is going to destabilize a large number of Western European countries. Yeah, well, it'll be interesting to see how that plays out uh, in the coming years. But, you know, you did write this piece for Monthly Review back in May. It was titled Africa's on the Move. And, of course, I'll link to that in the description of this video as well. Um, and I raised that just to note, you know, Africa is so often ignored by the mainstream media in the global north, unless of, there's some sort of drive for, like, U.S. military intervention in some African country. And then I think because the left in the U.S. is so often reacting to the mainstream media, they also end up ignoring Africa. And I'm sure there's some, you know, implicit racism in that as well. But I think for the most part, you know, to be generous, I think that that's probably one of the reasons. But the point is, you know, for many, Africa can seem like this just like sort of poor and confusing place that's too difficult to understand and isn't really like relevant right now, even though it's a continent with over a billion people that has, you know, historically been home to so many revolutions and a real like bedrock of the anti-colonial struggle. And of course, it's also the most exploited continent in the world. It's been sub subjected to hundreds of years of like resource theft and human theft and interference and assassinations and coups. And so that revolutionary potential is still absolutely there, perhaps like at its highest today, even though the continent remains captured by imperialism. So, and of course there are, you know, there are a couple at least independent governments in Africa that can act sort of as like alternatives, uh, alternative models, you know, they're, though they're totally maligned, like Eritrea comes to mind, a, a country that, you know, we at Breakthrough got to visit uh, late last year. But I'm curious, can you maybe, given all that I just said, can you explain to our mostly, you know, leftist listeners in the U.S., perhaps in Europe, Europe as well, why Africa is so important in the struggle against imperialism and how does it relate to that title of your piece, Africa is on the move? Well, the first thing to pay attention to is Africa is an extraordinarily rich continent. It is rich in resources, both human and, um, and in terms of natural resources. There are uh, you know, large number of universities, a high level of educated public and so on. And yet in most of the countries, there is miserable, miserable poverty. There is terrible mismanagement of the funds of the government and so on. Um, so you've got this immediate contradiction of an extraordinarily rich continent in, in, in resources, people, imagination and so on. And you've got this glaring poverty and theft of resources at the same time. And I think that's something to pay attention to. Secondly, it's not like the people on the continent have been sitting around doing nothing. I mean, the reason I drew that phrase, Africa is on the move from Walter Rodney, is that there are a number of important um, social and political movements uh, on the way. One area of important movement is the youth movement. It's an extremely young continent. You've got the Sankaraist movement in Burkina Faso, mostly young people, extraordinarily brave. You've got the youth movement in the Congo, extremely brave, organizing, having public meetings against enormous violence, both from the government and then um, in the eastern part of the, of the Democratic Republic of Congo, from the ceaseless and illegal interventions by the government of Rwanda, which comes into Goma and routinely um, you know, uh, sacks the country, as it were. 
Um, so you have all these youth protests taking place, many of them organized in different kind of networks, you know, running away from being closed down and being arrested and so on. Then you have the establishment of a new set of socialist organizations, quite explicitly socialist parties, some of them, uh, you know, with public uh, presences and so on, such as the Socialist Party of Zambia uh, ran for election, um, has a presence in most of the country. Again, a very rich country, rich with copper, rich with other minerals and so on, but impoverished by the theft of its resources. There's the Socialist Party of Zambia. There's the socialist movement in Ghana. Um, you know, the socialist movement in Ghana is a revival of the ideas of Kwame Nkrumah, the first president of Ghana, driving a left of center agenda in that country, um, building up a new generation of young people who are committed to, um, you know, the project of transcendence of all these terrible, um, you know, maladies like poverty and illiteracy and so on. You know, in, in a country like Nigeria, you've got somebody like Sean Kuti, the son of Fela Kuti, leading a mass struggle Again, largely of a lot of young people, but they're organized into a political force, um, trying to compel people into believing in the importance of a future, that even Nigerians can have a future. So you've got socialist movements in Zambia, Ghana, Nigeria. This is significant. And then you've got the uh, much more established left forces, for instance, in South Africa, big trade union movement, National Union of Metal Workers just finished their Congress. Um, you got the South African Communist Party, which has a new general secretary, Soli Mapila, who has been very, very forceful in his criticism of the government of South Africa, but yet understands that this government is playing a role, uh, you know, at least in foreign policy terms of not totally uh, bending its knee to the United States. But nonetheless, the South African Communist Party also uh, making quite vigorous critiques of, of the government, its economic policies and so on. So you've got a lot of activity, Rania, you know, from these youth movements, from social movements, women's movement in Tanzania, for instance, on the move, uh, rising up and so on. You've got new uh, movements of young people that are committed uh, to defending gays and lesbians on the continent. That's a new and powerful new development of how to understand oneself and so on. So, I mean... I don't look at the African continent and say, oh, my God, there's all this Western imperialism and so on. There are people doing things, struggling, fighting, trying to imagine new futures, pulling back the heritage of Lumumba, of Nkrumah, you know, pulling back the old uh, national liberation traditions and trying to build on them again. So it's a continent on the move, Rania. It's not a it's not a blight. You know, we don't need to assemble a bunch of pop musicians to sing a stupid song like, do they know it's Christmas? You know, I mean, do they know it's Christmas? Come on, Bob. Do they know it's Christmas? I mean, there's lots of people who are not Christian on the African continent. They are Muslims. They are animists. They are atheists. They are Hindus. They are all kinds of things. Do they know it's Christmas? And then, of course, the Quincy Jones song, you know, We Are The World. Well, it it, it is fitting for European and U.S. singers to sing We Are The World, you know. Um, well, what about Africa? The people of Africa, that's also the world. And they are building their own destiny. They don't need NATO. They don't need African command. Uh, they certainly don't need U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken and the U.S. President Joe Biden. They have their own political process and their destiny. Indeed. And on that note, I do just have a couple more questions for you, uh, tangentially related, you know, while I have you here, just to get your take on. First and foremost, I'm curious, and this is going to seem like a big pivot, but everything's connected. What do you think the U.S. wants with Taiwan, and why did Nancy Pelosi visit when she did? Well, you know, that's a that's an interesting story because, you know, it should be better known that under the Carter administration in 1978, the United States government recognized the People's Republic of China as the representative of the Chinese people. Uh, leaving to some extent ambiguity around Taiwan. By the way, Taiwan has a population of 22 million. It's not an enormous compared to 1.4 billion in the PRC. Uh, but that should not be a measure of anything. I don't mean, therefore, they should be absorbed. Okay, I didn't mean to say that. But it's it's only 22 million. Um, now, interestingly, right after that 1978 
um, you know, decision by the United States government, the U.S. passed the Taiwan Relations Act, which allowed the U.S. to maintain this kind of ambiguity of having an office in Taiwan and then doing arms sales to Taiwan, but then not really, you know, uh, making a show of it, but then doing it and, you know, inviting. And by the way, until 1987, Taiwan was essentially a one-party dictatorship. So it wasn't like democracy versus authoritarianism or anything. Okay, people don't know that. From 1949 to 1987, Taiwan was governed by an iron fist, and that iron fist was the Kuomintang. Um, in 1987, there was a kind of democratization, but the Kuomintang continued to govern for another 10 years, uh, ruthless, you know, against opposition and so on. Um, so the United States cuts this deal with Taiwan anyway after recognizing China as the most significant, you know, as the representative by saying, we'll sell you arms. We'll so they've used Taiwan in a way as an irritant against um, against China. This has got nothing to do with the Taiwanese people. Okay, Nancy Pelosi did not show up in Taipei to basically stand in solidarity with the Taiwanese people. She went to Taipei to just provoke the Chinese government, you know, to see what they would do. Well, the Chinese government they always think in five thousand, ten thousand year increment, <laughs> right. not like in two week, one day increment. They are thinking eventually Taiwan is going to fall. You know, the government will wrap up and it will basically Taiwan's entire economy is dependent on China. You know, you, you, you may not know this, but about 20 years ago, Rania, there was a political party formed in Taiwan called the 51st state. They wanted to actually join the United States as the 51st state. Oh, why would you want to do party. that? Well, oh. you know, it's interesting. What interested me was actually imagine, just imagine, just for as a mental exercise if xi jinping decided that you know he contacted some government official in hawaii or guam forget hawaii uh, hawaii is too far away but somebody in guam and he decided i'm going to fly to visit guam how would the <laughs> us react to that and guam is horribly a, yeah guam is an occupied zone it's 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 occupied by the us military the indigenous people of guam are second class citizens imagine if xi jinping did that i mean that's how the chinese see it this was a right. deliberate act of provocation. If the U.S. is actually interested in the human rights and so on of Taiwan, then the question should be asked of the U.S. government between, you know, at least 1949 and 1987. Not once did you squeak about democratic rights and human rights and so on of the Taiwanese people. You're quite happy with the iron fist of the Kuomintang. <laughs> it's the same with Hong Kong. You know, when Britain ruled Hong Kong, there were no rights for the people of Hong Kong. We never squeaked once about the human rights of the Hong Kong people. Now they use Hong Kong and Taiwan as a kind of pin to poke the Chinese. Now, exactly. there may be real issues involved in Taiwan and in Hong Kong and so on, but this is not what motivates the United States. Never. It's never what motivates the United States. Um, and then, you know, lastly, I just last time I had you on uh, to talk about Ukraine, actually, I also asked you about Sri Lanka, which at the time had these massive protests against uh, fuel and food shortages. And then, of course, since then, there's been a change in leadership after the prime minister's house was partied in by demonstrators and <laughs> what looked like a pretty stunning show. Um, and I, I think like the only real thing I saw about what happened in Sri Lanka from Western media was a slight attempt to try to like, I don't know, I don't know if it was to blame China or make it about China and say, oh, Sri Lanka is destabilized because it's in debt to China. But I didn't see much else. It's like the Western media didn't really care. Um, I'm curious if you can maybe update us on the situation there. And I don't know. It doesn't seem like it has anything at all to do with, with this like tug of war between China and, and the U.S. whatsoever, except for maybe some attempts in the media to make it about China. But that kind of failed. Well, uh, Sri Lanka is in debt to China. 10 percent of Sri Lanka's external debt is to China, but about 47 percent is to the West. Um, seems to me 47 is a larger number than 10. <laughs> a lot of that debt is to companies like BlackRock and so on. Uh, Sri Lanka has been 16 times to the IMF, including twice this year. Um, well, at least there's been conversations this year with the study mission and so on. But 16 times Sri Lanka has been since the 1960s directly to take IMF assistance. So the IMF has played a much bigger role in the destabilization of Sri Lanka than anybody else. That's not to say that there's no 
debt that is owed to the Chinese, but it's not that significant. That's the, the main thing. Secondly, there actually was no change of leadership. That's the scandal right. of what happened in Sri Lanka. There was a mass uprising, enormous numbers of people and so on against the Rajapakshas. Now, one of the problems was that the protest movement personalized it about the Rajapakshas. Rajapakshas fled. One of them went to Singapore, the other went to a naval base and, and hid there, cowered there. This is Mahinda Rajapaksha, the guy who the UN Human Rights Council has alleged committed genocidal violence against the Tamils. He's hiding in a naval base, you know. Well, when these people fled, yes, you're right. People went and partied in the house, swimming pool, watched themselves on TV. That's always a great photograph. <laughs> but what was interesting is in the middle of all this, suddenly Sri Lanka has a new government. Now, who's the head of the government? It's Mr. Ranil Vikramasinghe. Ranil Vikramasinghe, just a minute. I've heard that name before. Ranil Vikramasinghe, since 1993, has either been the prime minister of Sri Lanka or the opposition leader. So there's not been a year since 1993 till now that Mr. Vikramasinghe has not been sitting one side or the other of the parliament in a leader's chair. Interestingly, in the parliament, Vikramasinghe only had one seat, his own, and that too, he didn't win the seat. He was nominated in. He was backed by the Rajapakshya's political party to become the head of government. That means the Rajapakshya's are still pretty much in charge. He continued the emergency. He sent the military in to smash the protesters. And he had a lovey-dovey meeting with the U.S. ambassador where they talked about how Sri Lanka is going to sort out its external debt, blah, blah. He is mm. totally a pro-U.S. guy who, when he was in a position of power about three or four years ago, tried to get Sri Lanka to sign a deal with the Millennium Challenge Corporation, which is this private-public partnership agreement that the U.S. created to contest the Chinese Belt and Road Initiative. So, yeah, okay, the situation in Sri Lanka seems more stable now, but there was no real insurrection. Mm. And unfortunately, the protest movement didn't immediately call for the parliament to be dissolved. So the old Rajapaksha-dominated parliament is still around. So there hasn't actually been much of a change, which is a real tragedy for the Sri Lankan people. But what you do see now is a completely pro-American kind of toady-like character uh, sitting in the, uh, you know, in the governmental uh, power in Sri Lanka, who's regularly meeting the U.S. ambassador. And they're quite happy to put pictures of themselves on Twitter and so on. These are not clandestine meetings. Oh, wow. I mean, I think that's a real uh, challenge for a lot of this sort of like growing angst against this neoliberal rot that's making life so miserable all around the world is like not having an alternative ready to go uh, when you have a movement that's capable of like at least getting eyes on it and I don't know. Uh, breaking into the prime minister's house and swimming in his pool. Um, but on that note, VJ, I want to thank you for coming on Dispatches once again. It's always such a delight to have you on, and I always learn so much. I really, really appreciate it, and hopefully we can have you back on again soon. Well, and the next time I come, I hope we'll have color-coordinated shirts on again. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. On purpose next time. <laughs> okay, great. Thanks a lot. Thanks for watching, everyone. If you want to see more progressive anti-imperialist content like this, make sure you hit the subscribe button so you can stay up to date with the latest breakthrough news content. And if you want to support our work and get access to exclusive content, head over to patreon.com slash breakthrough news.